Uh, one of uh, the most prominent voices of liberty in matters of Latin America, and actually in, in just liberty proper in, in the world is, of course, Nobel laureate Mario Vargas Llosa. Now, Mario Vargas Llosa, when he was in Mexico in November, uh, said something that, that, that seemed um, to be a source of discontent at the time, which was that he was absolutely perplexed at what was going on in Latin America. This is November, late November uh, of, uh, uh, of 2019. And of course, in, in Mario's mind at that time, it was what is happening in Chile. In Chile, m many of you may have read a wonderful Wall Street Journal article of Axel Kaiser, who is here with us and will be sharing some insights on, on Chile. From, from oasis to chaos, what is it that happened to the favorite example throughout the world of how greater economic freedom and sound pro-market public policy is able to deliver uh, greater prosperity, a radical reduction in the, in the rate of poverty, even a reduction in the rate of income inequality, plus a great deal of opportunity as far as intelligent social safety nets and whatnot. What is it that happened? Why that anger? Why that vitriol? Why students demonstrating in the, in the streets? Why all kinds of people saying that the pension system was a piece of crap, excuse my Chilean, uh, when, uh, when, when in fact it is one of the models that Jose Piñera and others have taught us throughout the world that is a model to follow, when they didn't even know what that pension system was about, when people identified that the so-called IFPs, the individual retirement accounts, it's their property, it's not the AVP's property. What is it that went wrong there? And Axel will be sharing with you some of what went wrong there, but it was a very telling example and certainly a big blow to many of us that defend liberty in the uh, Latin American region that the prime example of what had occurred in the past 40 years in the region where Chile was considered almost a second world country a country that, is, that, that had been able to stand out as far as rule of law, peaceful transition to democracy, uh, a, a, a freedom of the press with reliable institutions, a reliable investment regime, stability in the unit of account, um, uh, uh, private property, uh, aggressive and intelligent public policy, all of a sudden implodes. All of a sudden implodes. And then you have the copycats in Colombia and in Ecuador trying to do the same thing. And of course, it's the Kirshners and the intellectuals and, and, and the uh, Naomi Kleins and the John Ackermans and the Jose Taibolos that are saying, oh, you see, this is the result of the long neoliberal nightmare. And you can't, it's, it's almost like they, it's when they wake up in the morning and, and, they, and they, they, they have their, their listering and the, the long neoliberal nightmare. And they can't get away from that phrase. That's where the argument ends with them. And pointing to what is happening in Chile, the demonstrations, the riots, the violence, and whatnot. So it is a very, very challenging times. And it is also a source of what Mario Vargas Llosa calls perplexity. Absolute perplexity. Why is it that there's such a response, such a venomous angry and vitriolic response to some reforms or to uh, structural changes that had occurred in these countries. Colombia that has gone through an enormous process of trying to rid itself of that image when we used to say, oh, let us hope 25 years ago, let us hope that other Latin Americans don't Colombianize themselves. They had even perfected the art of turning their country into a verb. Let's not, well, now, now they call it, don't Mexicanize yourself, but that's another matter. We'll, we'll deal with that uh, in, in, in separate. So what, it, what is it that, that all of a sudden, the fights that we thought that we had already surpassed, the battle of ideas that we thought we had already won, in the case of Chile, all of a sudden implodes and uh, basically spits in our, in our face. And then we turn to Argentina the eternal land of underdevelopment, of Peronism, of clientelism, patrimonialism, crony capitalism, and everything that has signified the worst type of corruption that you can see with, with the state and with the uh, existing bureaucracy. There seemed to be a source of hope four years ago when Macri was able to defeat uh, Cristina Kirchner. 
And all of a sudden, now you have the return of Peronism. They weren't able to withstand the, the, uh, the adjustment that went with um, shifting to fiscal discipline or trying to practice a, a more sound public policy to the extent that even Macri himself before uh, during, during the election period was turning even more Peronist or, 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 or more Kirchnerian than Cristina Kirchner herself. So now we have Alberto Fernandez, the president, and Cristina, the vice president. And they're even fighting among each other to see who's actually going to be the more radical uh, of the two. So Ar Ar Argentina, this, this, this nation that at one time uh, was among the top five in the world, as far as GDP per capita, levels of prosperity, and the like, seems to be another case of absolute chaos. Chile and Argentina, and right next uh, neighbors, of course, and uh, each of them next to each other. And, and so then we turn to Bolivia, and we also see manifestations, but those are of a different source, at least from my interpretation, uh, a, a source of even of hope, because there the manifestations, the demonstrations, and the anger was directed towards the obvious and illegal authoritarianism of Evo Morales that finally was able to fall after he had promised and re-promised and promised over his re-promises again that he would not run for another election, he goes ahead and runs for another election. The election is rigged, completely rigged. I mean, there's obvious fraud. Even, uh, even international multilateral agencies were able to tell that it's fraud. He still wants to maintain himself in power, and he's somehow deposed by the equivalent of a, a popular revolt, and of course, leave it to the Mexicans to offer him asylum two, two days later, which was a major, major em embarrassment from, from my point of view. So that's, that's a different source of turbulence and of discontent that I think tells against the hypothesis that this is an organized movement by the Foro de Sao Paulo or the Grupo de Puebla or some other organized movement, there's definitely a component of intelligence and of military intelligence in some of these demonstrations and, and some of these riots. But I, I think we have to go case by case and country by country. No less we can talk about also what has been occurring recently in El Salvador and in Nicaragua, we have here tonight one of the greatest uh, heroes of the Latin America Liberty Movement, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge him and have him stand up, Felix Madariaga from Nicaragua, who's... Uh, this, this, this man has had his assets seized in Nicaragua. He's been expelled from the country. He's been tortured, and now he's back. And he's back fighting for freedom. Y te deseamos mucha suerte de todo corazón, mi querido Félix. And probably the, 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 the two of the craziest examples, one, one of them is my own country, which we, we won't go in the, into the details of it, but Mexico seemed to be on the heels of demonstrating to the rest of the world that proper public policy, commitment to fiscal discipline, commitment to greater economic freedom, and especially the, the tremendous impact of trade with the rest of the world, not just with the United States and Canada under NAFTA, but on all borders, had transformed Mexico into something that uh, Ricardo Lopez Murphy just last week, the Argentinian uh, economist and former presidential candidate that visited us in Mexico, was explaining what Mexico was able to do in the past 25 years, and especially under its commitment to open trade in all of its borders, was truly incredible. It showed to the world that uh, Latin American countries do not have to be commodity-based. It's not the it's not the good times do not come when uh, the price of oil is higher, the price of copper is higher, or, or the price of aluminium is higher, the price of whatever commodity of of of, of soy is high, whatever commodity uh, uh, of the, of the moment that uh, that that happens to sustain the well-being of those countries. Mexico, that was supposed to be a, a petrol-based country was able to diversify its export structure, radically diversify it, and actually turn energy into less than 5% of its total output, of its total, uh, uh, of the economy, it only represents 5%. 
manufacturing and services and export diversification have become much more important. That's a story we can tell 20, 25 years after the fact, 25 years after trade liberalization. But it is a story that has to be told, and it is a story that shows that Latin America does not necessarily, is not necessarily permanently caught as a, a place of the land of mañana and the land of absolutely no hope. But despite that marvelous accomplishment, here we have the equivalent of a tropical messiah in Andres Manuel López Obrador that is, that is the typical example of extreme illiberal populism. Intolerance mixed with ignorance, mixed with a deep sense of resentment against whatever happened in the past in the past so-called long neoliberal nightmare, and with a deep nostalgia of returning to the 1960s and the 1970s. That is a very dangerous equation that has a very strong authoritarian streak to it, and we will still have a long way to go to see what the outcome is going to be under Lopez Obrador. So far, the crime rate and, and violence and corruption are at absolutely sky high levels and the economy for the first time in 25 years since Mexico was part of the North American Free Trade Agreement has decoupled from North American growth. Whereas the United States and Canada are growing this way, Mexico is now the heading full uh, speed ahead into a recession. So that's a very toxic combination that I think will produce uh, um, the equivalent of a Pandora's box. We don't know what's, what's going to happen, but it is certainly a, a source of, of uh, perplexity and also a source of deep worry for those of us that live south of the Rio Grande uh, border. Uh, perhaps the greatest source of perplexity comes, of course, from Venezuela. How is it possible? How is it possible that the, that the real forgotten men and women of Venezuela are able to endure such misery, are able to endure the authoritarianism, the brutality, the almost cannibalistic environment that you have to live in in order to survive, not day by day, it's minute by minute. The long run is the next 30 seconds in Venezuela. There's absolutely no economic calculation with an inflation rate that is 400,000%. Last year, Maduro, in his tremendous intelligence, was boasting that inflation had been reduced from a million percent to 400,000%. That's like being in a supermarket and instead of prices rising in the next 20 minutes, they rise in the next 17 minutes or the next 25 minutes. So you gain three or four minutes. It's still an absolute basket case. There's no possibility of any type of investment. And with growth at minus 20, minus 30, again, minus 20 and minus 30 is whatever. It doesn't matter anymore. It's an absolute economic implosion. How is it possible that he's still able to sustain power is, in fact, to me, the source of perplexity. And of course, you've had this incredible brain drain from Venezuela that has gone, the Venezuelans from, from all walks of life have gone throughout all of Latin America trying to find at least a source of opportunity, have gone into the United States, have gone to the rest of the world, trying to find trying to find hope and opportunity. It is really a tragedy, and as Lopez Murphy himself had characterized, this is probably the most dramatic case of uh, mismanagement and of economic tragedy occasioned by full-scale Bolivarian socialism or any type of socialism that you have seen ever. Not even the USSR, not even Eastern Europe compares to the damage and the misery that has been imposed on the top of Venezuelan people, and still they're able, they're able to keep a good face and welcome you with a smile. And it's something uh, that, that, that justifies comment, and I think we're going to, I hope that we're going to be able to discuss what happens in Venezuela next. We were hopeful last year that Maduro would fall and the Juan uh, Guaido regime w w would come to the fore, that didn't happen. There's still a great deal of, of discussion going on about the future of Venezuela, but something has got to give at some moment because uh, truly it, the, these are people that, uh, um, that are simply would like a little bit of freedom and a little bit of light and a little bit of hope in order to get ahead. And what they've done throughout the rest of the world in, in incredibly backward conditions and everything against them and this flood of immigration has been absolutely remarkable. So you would want that human capital to return 
to Venezuela and turn it into the great uh, uh, source of prosperity that it once was and that certainly could be again. So here we have the question, the crucial question, why? Why has liberty in Latin America been so challenged in the face of all these uh, developments in 2000, 2019 and onwards? We have a great deal of anger and dissatisfaction. A lot of it has to do with uh, cronyism, corruption, crony capitalism, certainly the, the, uh, uh, the vicious cycle of uh, uh, corruption, uh, violence, and, and impunity. Perhaps also there's an explanation having to do with the fact that Latin America became accustomed, almost like a morphine addict, to the uh, super cycle of the, the, the commodity boom years when every, all these prices were sky high and like a trust fund child effect that it doesn't matter what I do and what idiocies I am, I'm involved in, I'm always going to get the monthly check. Certainly Argentina, I think, is a prime example of this, as was Venezuela. But perhaps one of the themes that we're going to listen to in the next few days is what Axel Kaiser calls the need for a counter-narrative. The need to retake the challenge of ideas. The fight for reason, no less. Octavio Paz, our great uh, Mexican poet, Nobel laureate, and, and classical liberal, uh, he called the Latin American state the equivalent of a philanthropic ogre. El ogro filantropico that works on the basis of a pyramid that is completely corrupt on the inside. But curiously enough, it's that grease and that corruption and that graft that is able uh, to sustain it. How to deconstruct the philanthropic ogre? Well, many of us thought 25, 30 years ago that it was in the battle of ideas, in the construction of narratives, in the possibilities, that the opportunities that uh, liberalization and freedom bring about. And that's the challenge that we face today, and especially in light of the rise of this very uh, perplexing romance that many of those that belong in the millennial generation have with the Alexandria Cortez style socialism and that, uh, that addiction to the vanity of instant redemption. That is, not, that is not going to be fought with subsidies, with government programs, and uh, even with um, all kinds of uh, public-private enterprises. It's going to be fought with ideas. It's going to be fought by telling the story again and again, by repeating the old truths that trade is a positive sum game, that you can't spend more than what you have, that, that stability in, in the unit of account is fundamental and even moral, and all of those uh, uh, aspects of what human progress and human freedom are all uh, about. But that counter-narrative has to be constructed. And there's a great deal of creative work, of a great deal of imagination that has to go into th almost like a design thinking approach to how we're going to market our ideas, how we're going to place our ideas. Reason, of course, has been a great source of inspiration for, these, uh, for, uh, for this uh, method or, or these uh, forms of thinking in, in the past, and, and we certainly hope to continue to derive inspiration from the work uh, that, they, uh, that they do. That storytelling is absolutely fundamental. Whatever was deconstructed by those uh, protests of violence, by that nostalgia to return to the past, by that rabid authoritarianism that characterizes uh, um, the new liberal uh, populace. How can we reconstruct our narratives in a, matter, in a manner that does not fall into the credentialism and the trap of the tyranny of the experts that William Easterly so beautifully denounced in his criticism of technocracy and the Washington consensus and the idea of imposing models from above. No, it's from the ground up, it's from context, it's from looking into the everyday lives of, of uh, women and men uh, that, that live in our communities and, and that develop their own spontaneous orders. Uh, and for those of you that is your first time in Guatemala or, or in Latin America, look at the informal worker. Look at those that work in the informal economy. They're heroes of entrepreneurship, not just because they're doing it extra legally, but precisely because in spite of the laws and in spite of the bureaucracy and in spite of the threats, they're able to get ahead. How much creativity goes into doing something like that? And it's not like they're doing something illicit. They're selling you a Diet Coke on the street 
Or they're, or they're selling you a mask of Salinas de Gortari, or in Mexico, Donald Trump, but uh, I hope I don't offend any sensibilities. <laughs> so in closing, I think, I think we should also be very watchful and very careful of what happens in the Atlantic. One of the great paradoxes of what occurred last year, or in the past two years in Latin America, is that the, the models to follow, let us say Mexico and Chile, all of a sudden there's a tremendous reversal there and we have to question what happened. And yet the Atlantic, that was always the land of, of, of state interventionism and of protectionism, is beginning to offer a certain light of hope. Brazil and Uruguay, uh, I hope things go well there. Uh, I think that uh, Bolsonaro's, um, despite the fact that he's, that he's uh, uh, almost, uh, um, well, I wouldn't say detestable, but a very, very controversial political figure with what he says, uh, uh, nevertheless has assembled an economic team that they're saying all the right things. And I like their counter narratives. I like the way they're presenting this. It's not the haughty technocracy technocrat that is the tyranny of the experts that I'm going to tell you exactly how you're going to be free, right? It's not that fatal conceit of the old style economic liberalism of the, of the, uh, uh, of the technocrats. It's rather a much more ambitious attempt to popularize the gains of, uh, of economic freedom. So I'd be watchful uh, about that. Um, the, the story of trade that I told about Mexico and the the, uh, the 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 very the caricature that I gave of the the entrepreneurship of what McCloskey calls Deidre McCloskey calls the entrepreneurial virtue that sustains and that and that fuels the uh, informal economy in Latin America. It's not that we want that model, but it shows you that there's definitely a tremendous amount of untapped potential that if we only had simple rules for a complex world, we, were, we would be able to achieve tremendous levels of prosperity. So those are the main lessons. Focus on the narratives, on what Axel calls the, 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 the counter narratives, uh, the battle uh, of ideas, the storytelling that has characterized some of Reason's most remarkable work. Uh, Tom Palmer of, uh, of Atlas has a beautiful way of describing it. How can we recapture, recapture civil and reasoned discourse? That's what liberty is all about. It's the magic and the ability to listen to the other. In Spanish, we have a famous saying, hablando se entiende la gente. That's how I like to see th this type of event, and that's certainly how it would characterize this effort by Reason Foundation to be with us this evening and throughout the seminar. Thank you very much.